from my mother's womb you have chosen Your family, blood brought in smooth, my I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. I'm no longer a slave. Good morning. I hope you were paying attention to those words in Christ Jesus. We are children of God. That's powerful, powerful stuff. Let me highlight some things. I think you've been seeing on the screen behind me what's happening and the opportunities that await you, but I want to highlight a couple. The last summer rock will be tomorrow night, and then we will in September begin a new uh, session of Rock Men's Discipleship. Our last one for the summer is tomorrow night at 6.15, and Lori will probably send out an email, so respond if you want food, please, for tomorrow night. Um, men's Bible study tomorrow, Farm Life Wednesday night. A new ladies' Bible study began, the book of Genesis, all the way back at the beginning, um, started last week, so you're only a week behind, you can catch up. Ladies, if you have questions, see Jane back there um, and tell her you're interested and, and you can ask her questions. Uh, a couple other things that I want to call to your attention, um, Crossover Cups Mission Documentary will be released this Saturday at 7 p.m. And you'll be able to go online to their webpage. Some of you are thinking, what in the world is Cups? It is the mission organization we coupled with, with our Dominican Republic trip 
uh, back in July. So this is a documentary on how they ended up in the DR and what God's been doing there and just an opportunity for you to pay attention to, to how God has been at work there. Jerry, where's Jerry? Is he in here? There he is. Thank you. He's been teaching us from the book of John, um, the, uh, the Lord's words to us, and finished up today with chapter 17, and he's going off on some anniversary gig, 50? 50 years. That's awesome. Um, congratulations. <clears throat> John Harvey will be I'm getting hand signals. Are you giving her hand signals or me hand signals? Okay, they're talking to themselves. Okay, John Harvey will start the book of Acts, the first section of the book of Acts, uh, next Sunday morning. That's upstairs. Downstairs will continue um, the, the chosen. I, all I could say was the life of Christ. <laughs> the chosen. And they're looking at segments from the chosen. If you've seen it, then you're familiar. If not, I would encourage you to uh, participate with them. They're watching segments of the chosen and then looking at scripture and saying, okay, what's accurate? Is there anything that, that is not? What does scripture actually say about who this Christ is that we're watching? So those are options for adult Sunday school and our student Sunday school is in the chosen, the youth, and then the children downstairs in this building. Um, officer nominations in the month of August. You need to fill out the form either online or the one in the lobby. You need to sign it, and they need to sign it, and, uh, and just be prayerfully considering who God would have uh, to serve as elders and deacons for the next three years. Um, interested in finding out about Faith Church? Maybe you've been here for a little bit. Maybe you're brand new, and you'd like to find out a little bit more about Faith Church. Next Sunday, the 28th, after the worship service, stick around for lunch, and, uh, and we'll introduce you to, um, to what it means to be part of the body at Faith Church. We draw blood, and we take your money, and I'm just kidding. Um, it's, just a, it's, it's an opportunity for you just to discover, and we just invite you to come and find out um, and see what God's doing. Stephanie, come up here and talk to us about another opportunity that's, uh, that's coming up that we can plug into as well. What am I pointing to? Yes. I did not, but I will. Small groups are meeting this afternoon, and as far as I know, there's Carol. Good job. She is here, and everybody's meeting. Um, and so, the, not the guys, but the girls. Junior high girls at the Yawns, senior high girls at Two Arts, right? And the senior and junior high guys, we're, we're planning to meet next Sunday. So, we will not meet this Sunday. Okay? Okay, Stephanie, thank you. Good morning, Faith Church. I'm Stephanie Brunick, and on behalf of the Connecting to the Body Committee um, and Lee, who's on the committee with us, and our friend Ashley, um, we have some exciting news to share about an event coming up in September. Um, on Tuesday, September 13th, we're going to have a back-to-school event for the students here at Faith Church um, from 5 to 7. Um, we have created this event um, with our students in mind, but the Lord has taken it one step further, and he said, we want to include the teachers and staff at Piney Woods Elementary, which is where Ashley works. Um, she has such a heart for these teachers, and she was trying to think of um, something she could do for them um, to mentor for them. So we have um, come up with this event um, and we are also working with the Connecting to Others Committee. Um, Kathy Simpson has been gracious enough to get a prayer team together for us. Um, so what we're going to do at this event is we're going to have um, activities and food for our students. And then these teachers and their families are also included. Um, and we are going to have the opportunity to pray for these teachers and the students and their families. Um, we would love to have our youth join in on this event, whether um, you want to pray or help set up, um, help serve in activities or serve food. Um, so if you're interested in that, let any of us know. Okay, there we go. Thank you.
Good morning, faith family. Join me in prayer, please. God, you tell us in Psalm 46, verse 1, that you are our refuge, strength, always ready to help in times of troubles. We have so much to be thankful for, but you, God, being our refuge and strength and ready to help us in times of trouble is a tremendous blessing. We need extra strength when we are at our weakest, and we need a place to run when the world overwhelms. We need a big God. We need an unchangeable shepherd to guide us. Our world has fallen for Satan's basic strategy, hook, line, and sinker. Satan's strategy, the same one he used on Adam and Eve, is to make us believe that sin brings fulfillment when sin really robs us of fulfillment and makes our life empty, confused, and messy. You tell us in Matthew 24, verse 6, there will be wars and rumors of wars. So we hold up the people of Ukraine and Taiwan. Let them find strength and refuge in you as they go through these difficult times. Our country is no different. It has fallen for Satan's strategy also. We are on the wrong path as much as the rest of the world. We are looking for our identity and peace apart from you, God, and that is doomed to total failure. Allow our country and its leaders to return to you for strength, refuge, and guidance. You tell us to pray for all things, and you will be ready to help. Moses prayed and the sea parted. Joshua prayed and the walls fell. Elijah prayed and fire came down from heaven. We pray for our church that it will always seek you for refuge and strength. We pray for our church leaders that they will always let you be their shepherd for direction and guidance. We pray for the new deacons and elders who will be stepping up to serve for the next three years. We ask you to listen and provide just what we need in an assistant pastor in your perfect timing. We ask for an extra measure of strength for Carl he is carrying more than a double load. Let him always find his refuge in you, God. We thank you for allowing the 26 members of the DR team to see you work powerfully. We thank you that they have returned safely and that they came home with a different worldview. We ask for extra physical and spiritual strength for Alva, Scott, Susan, Kinsley, Mary Joyce, Trevine, Ron and Carolyn, Steve and Kay, Kathy and Nancy's brother, Joe, as they face health issues. God, you designed us to be in relationship with you and with the people around us. We ask that you strengthen all the marriages here at Faith Church. We pray for all the families at Faith and all their relationships. And we pray all this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. I want to read, you know where this is, the book of Matthew, Old or New Testament? New Testament. The first book of the New Testament is the book of Matthew. Matthew is one of the Gospels, and you know what that means. Gospel means, what does it mean? Good. Gospel means good Oh my goodness, y'all are asleep. Good news. What's the good news about? I should say, who is the good news about? About Jesus. And at the very end of that gospel, when Jesus is about to leave the disciples and go back to heaven from where he came, he says to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples. So he's giving them a charge. You, and you, and you, and you, and me, and all those people, look at them. All those people were charged to make disciples, and he's going to tell us how to do that, um, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you, 
And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. I want to focus on that. Yeah. Who wants to give me money? Oh, <laughs> let's let Liam do it. Liam was the only one who didn't raise his hand. See if you can tell what's in there, Liam. It's close, not crayons, but close. Close. You're in the ballpark. Yes, reach in there and pull them out. So a brand new box should be number two pencils. What does that make you think about? School. School. How many of you went back to school this week? Three, four out of four. Okay, went back to school. So Pastor Carl is going to contribute to your school fund. There you go. Everybody gets a number two pencil. Now, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to ask you a question first. What did you miss about school? Friends. Friends? Okay. Pizza. 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 Okay. <laughs> what else did you miss about school? Anything? Did you guys miss your friends? Miss anything else? Teachers? Did you get teachers that you like? Don't answer that out loud. They might be in here. Do you like your teachers? Yeah. yeah cool. Well, that's what I wanted to focus on. In fact, I'm going to give you two pencils, and I want you to share one with somebody else, okay? Tell them Pastor Carl gave him a pencil, and you're giving it to him as well, okay? So I want you, I'm going to ask you, did you give your pencil away? So you need to give your pencil away this week to somebody. And this is what he says. One of the things that he tells us to do to make disciples is to teach them. What do we teach them? Well, he says so, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. What does that word observe mean? Any idea? To see, to look at. But more than that, I think Jesus wants us to teach each other how to be obedient to his word. Now, how do you help somebody do what God's word says? Do you just stand out of them and go, Margie, I want you to do this. Margie, I want you to do this. Margie, I want Is that how you teach people to observe what God commanded? I mean, she needs to know, right? But what if I show her by my own behavior? Would that help, you think? Yeah? If I said, Liam, I want you to build a birdhouse. Go build a birdhouse. Okay? And he didn't do it. So I go, Liam, I told you to build a birdhouse. Go build a birdhouse. But if he's never seen anybody build a birdhouse, he may not know how to do that. What if I helped him by showing him how to build a birdhouse. Well, that's what Jesus is telling us to do, to teach each other, to teach others how to do what God said in His Word. And one of the greatest ways we teach it, just like your teachers at school teach you various things, we need to teach people what Jesus said. And we do that in Sunday school. We do that in small groups. We do that in the worship service. But we also do it every day with how we live. So when you guys are with other students, your behavior shows them and teaches them how to be obedient to God's Word or not. And so we need to ask for God's help that we would be obedient so that we can help the people around us learn how to do what God commanded. Let's ask for His help, okay? Jesus, thank You for giving us Your Word so we know what it looks like to live the way you want us to, and that's best. Even when it sometimes may not feel like it, it's best. And you've given us the privilege of teachers. There's a room full of them seated around us who have taught and continue to teach us by both word and deed how to do what you've told us to do, Jesus. Now would you help us? Would you help these students to help other students see Jesus? and what it means to be obedient to Him. Help us that we would teach others. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh Lord, You have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down, You know when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down. And you are acquainted with all my ways. 
Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it all together. You hem me in behind and before and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. I invite you to turn with me to 2 Kings chapter 10, and I warn you, in so turning, you might want to buckle your seatbelt. 2 Kings chapter 10, 
And I want to read that, and I want to remind you as we read it, that it's God's Word to you. It's the revelation of Himself to you and to me. 2 Kings chapter 10, you're going to find to be mm, one of those movies you might have to be in a mood for, okay? I'm just asking you to buckle up and, and listen to what he has to say. Uh, 2 Kings chapter 10, now Ahab, you remember Ahab, he was a bad king in, in the, of the people of God, and, and it's said of him he did worse, he did more evil than the, all the ones before him. He had 70 sons in Samaria, so Jehu wrote letters and sent them to Samaria, to the rulers of the city, to the elders, and to the guardians of the sons of Ahab, saying, Now then, as soon as this letter comes to you, seeing your master's sons are with you, and there are with you chariots and horses, fortified cities also, and weapons, select the best and fittest of your master's son, and set him on his father's throne, and fight for your master's house. Jehu is the newly appointed, anointed king. And what he's saying is, in tradition, instead of all these people getting involved and dying, you set up your leader, I'll be the one he fights, and let's go at it, and we'll settle who's the king. But they were exceedingly afraid and said, Behold, uh, the two kings could not stand before him. How can we stand? So he was over the palace, and he who was over the city, together with the elders and guardians, sent to Jehu, saying, We are your servants, and we will do all that you tell us. We will not make anyone king. Do whatever ever is good in your eyes. Then he wrote to them a second letter saying, If you are on my side, and if you are ready to obey me, take the heads of your master's sons and come to me at Jezreel tomorrow at this time. Now the king's sons were 70 persons. Uh, the 70 persons were with the great men of the city who were bringing them up. And as soon as the letter came to them, they took the king's sons and slaughtered them, 70 persons, and put their heads in baskets and sent them at Jezreel. When the messenger came and told him they had brought the heads of the king's sons, he said, lay them in two heaps at the entrance of the gate until the morning. Then in the morning, are you kidding me? Like, are you hearing this? Like at the gate, just lay them in the front yard, either side of the front door. Really? Really? Then in the morning when he went out, he stood and said to all the people, You are innocent. It was I who conspired against my master and killed him, but who struck down all these. Know then that there shall fall to the earth nothing of the word of the Lord which the Lord spoke concerning the house of Ahab, for the Lord has done what he said by his servant Elijah. At this point, I hope you're, well, some of you may be scratching your head going, What does God have to do with this? Well, hang in, in there, and hopefully we'll know by the end of the day. Um, so Jehu struck down all who remained of the house of Ahab, verse 11, in Jezreel, all his great men and his close friends and his priests until he left him none remaining. Then he sent out and went to Samaria. On the way, he was at beth Haged of the shepherds. Jehu met the relatives of Ahaziah, king of Judah, and he said, who are you? And they answered, we are the relatives of Ahaziah, and we came down to visit the royal princes and the sons of the queen mother. He said, take them alive. They took them alive, slaughtered them at the pit of beth Eked, 42 persons, and he spared none of them. And when he departed from there, he met Jehonadab, the son of Rechab, coming to meet him. And he greeted him, and he said to him, is your heart true to my heart as mine is to yours? And Jehonadab answered, it is. Jehu said, if it is, give me your hand. So he gave him his hand. Jehu took him up with him into the chariot. And he said, come with me. See my zeal for the Lord. So he had him ride in his chariot. And when he came to Samaria, he struck down all who remained to Ahab in Samaria till he had wiped them out according to the word of the Lord that he spoke to Elijah. Then Jehu assembled all the people and said to them, Ahab served Baal a little, but Jehu will serve him much. So this is Jehu, the new king. He says, hey, Ahab served him a little, the really evil dude, but I'm going to serve Baal a lot. Now therefore called me all the prophets of Baal, all of his worshipers, all his priests. Let none be missing, for I have a great sacrifice to offer Baal. If you're a Baal worshiper, you're thinking, hot dog, this is great. We got the right leader, and we're going to worship Baal with our new leader. Nobody needs to miss out on this one. 
Whoever is missing shall not live. Guess we better go. But Jehu did it with cunning in order to destroy the worshipers of Baal. And Jehu ordered sanctify a solemn assembly for Baal. So they proclaimed it. And Jehu sent throughout all Israel and all the worshipers of Baal came so that there was not a man left who did not come. And they entered the house of Baal. And the house of Baal was filled from one end to the other. He said to him, who has who was in charge of the wardrobe? I like this. We're going to send out something for next Sunday. If you're not here, we're going to kill you. And, and I think you might show up, right? I mean, that's what he just did for Baal worshipers. And so they all show up, and he gets the wardrobe, bring out the vestments for all the worshipers of Baal, brought out the vestments for them, then said to the worshipers of Baal, search, see that there's no servant of the Lord among you. Make sure there's nobody here serving the Lord. Um, but only Baal worshippers. Then they went in to offer sacrifices and burnt offerings. Now Jehu had stationed 80 men outside and said, the man who allows any of those whom I give into your hands to escape shall forfeit his life. So as soon as he had made an end to the offering, the burnt offering, Jehu said to the guard and the officers, go in and strike them down, let not one man escape. So when they put them to the sword, the guard and the officers cast them out and went into the inner room of the house of Baal. And they brought out the pillar that was in the house of Baal and burned it. And they demolished the pillar of Baal and demolished the house of Baal and made it a latrine to this day. You're watching this movie on TV. Don't think for a minute what you're thinking about what you're reading. Think for a minute. You're there watching this movie and you're watching Jehu wipe out Baal worship that should have been wiped out a long time ago. And you're going, yes! This is what's happening. And there's a reason God wanted you to know this. Thus Jehu wiped out Baal from Israel, but Jehu did not turn aside from the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, which he made Israel to sin. That is, the golden calves that were in Bethel and Dan. And the Lord said to Jehu, because you have done well in carrying out what is right in my eyes and have done to the house of Ahab, according to all that was in my heart, your sons of the fourth generation shall sit on the throne of, Je of Israel. And that did happen. But Jehu was not careful to walk in the law of the Lord, the God of Israel, with all his heart. He did not turn from the sins of Jeroboam, which he made Israel to sin. In those days, the Lord began to cut off parts of Israel. Hazael defeated them throughout the territory of Israel, from the Jordan eastward, all the land of Gilead, the Gadites, the Reubenites, the Manassites, from Aor, which is by the valley of Arnon, that is Gilead and Bashan. Now the rest of the acts of Jehu and all that he did and all his might, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Israel? So Jehu slept with his father, and they buried him in Samaria, and Jehoahaz, his son, reigned in his place. The time that Jehu reigned over Israel and Samaria was 28 years. Pray with me. Father, we come to you children of God. What a privilege that is. And yet in our own right, our own strength, we haven't what it takes to understand 2 Kings 10, much less why you put it in Scripture. We are grateful for it, and we ask that you grant us understanding. We don't simply want to have head knowledge. We want, as we were exposed to Jehu and his lack of fullness of heart, we want a full heart, God, to serve you, to understand you. So help us. In Jesus' name, amen. So yesterday was yard day. Anybody else have a yard day yesterday? And, and part of it was spreading the mulch in the backyard and Part of I found this new 30-second cleaner. I'm going to sound like an advertisement. You just hook it to your hose and you spray it on and it cleans the house, okay? I don't recommend it. Don't do it. And here's why. It did a great job, but I found things at my house that I frankly didn't want to know. You know the columns on the front porch? You know those new columns 20 years ago? They're not new anymore and they need help. And the brick, you know, there's a crack in the mortar and the, you know, my house is probably slipping into the abyss. Um, it, it's like everywhere I went, you know, there's moss growing on those brand new shingles that are 20 years old. The nerve of it. You know, it's just like everywhere I went, I discovered something new. 
And frankly, some of it, I, I just, not sure I want to know. And here we are, 2 Kings chapter 10. How many vote we just sort of move on and just like have like a benediction or something? What do you do with this? You read it, tell us. What do you do with 2 Kings chapter 10? And I would say pay attention. And here's a question. Could it be that we don't want to pay attention because we just don't want to know? I just don't want to see that. I don't want to know that the columns are deteriorating on my front porch. The nerve of them. I don't want to discover things that need to be taken care of. Anybody approach God's Word that way? Yeah, yeah, that's great, but can we talk about like the Braves or something? Do we really have to talk about 2 Kings chapter 10? I mean, that's kind of a bloody chapter. And the challenge is to really listen to what God has to say. Here's here's the key verse in, in this context that I really want you to see under this point. Know then that there shall fall to the earth nothing of the word of the Lord. Are you beginning to hear that repeatedly in these first 10 chapters? God is saying, pay attention. My word is for you to hear. Nothing that I said will fall to the earth. Which the Lord spoke concerning the house of Ahab, for the Lord has done what he said by his servant Elijah. I don't know about you, but there are times when I don't, I don't know what to do with the Word of, the, of God, like 2 Kings chapter 10. As a result, I'm more inclined to move on to a softer passage. I'll bet none of us has verses from 2 Kings 10 cross-stitched hanging on our wall. Or on a 3 by 5 card stuck to the mirror or the refrigerator. Could it be that we're, we're just often too busy, too distracted, or just plain uninterested in listening to what God has to say? Could it be that what God has to say conflicts with my current level of comfort encouraging me to turn a deaf ear? Uh, nah. Could that even be a possibility? And yet listen to Deuteronomy chapter 6 as God challenges His people. You're familiar with this text. Now this is the commandment, the statutes and the rules that the Lord your God commanded me to teach you, that you may do them in the land in which you are going over to possess it, that you may fear the Lord your God and you and your son and your son's son by keeping all His statutes and His commandments which I command you all the days of your life and that your days may be long. Listen to what He says in verse 3. Hear, therefore, O Israel... And be careful to do them that it may go well with you and that you may multiply greatly as the Lord, the God of your fathers, has promised you in a land flowing with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. I got a little clue. Turning a deaf ear to the columns on my front porch, to the crack in the mortar, to the things that need attention at my house, won't change what's about to happen. I can do this and this, and they will still need attention. Even more so in the days to come. It's been some years ago now, I remember one of our children right here taking a Valentine, taking the the permit written test. Any of you remember those days? There was so much noise in the DMV that it was hard to hear what he was reading on the test. There's so much information screaming for our attention today that's become quite difficult for us to listen to what God has to say. My my question is, are we really interested in helping people understand the world in which we live, media, or are we more interested in getting you to listen to us? And so it seems like in this world of information where we're overwhelmed, 
we have to do something bigger and better so that you'll pay attention. And the Word of God stands true. Are we listening? The challenge is to be intentional with the Word of God, and the challenge is to schedule daily time to read it. Do you use a devotional book? That's fine. But don't start with the Word of God. Read it daily. This is God writing to you. I want you to imagine yourself in love in college. Your sweetheart is in Arkansas for break. And she hypothetically sends a letter back to Columbia. And I ask one of you to read it and tell me what she says. Are you kidding me? No, I didn't ask you to read it and tell me what she says. I may read it and say, dude, look what she said. She's out of her mind. She loves me. Why would you take his letter to you and let someone else read it and tell you what he said to you? This is his word to you. Listen to it. Even 2 Kings chapter 10, because it's part of his love letter to you. Keep in mind that he has preserved all 66 books of the Old and New Testaments with great care, with great precision, and he wanted you to know 2 Kings chapter 10. So listen to it. So it occurs to me that sometimes we may not listen because we just don't want to know. But then there's this other objection when the resources to accomplish what we read or see or observe are just not there. I mean, as I go around the house, it's like, you know, you start spraying with that thing and you need a, like a 55-gallon barrel of that stuff because everything needs spraying. Even the banister around the porch. You know, and then you start spraying the little green stuff on there and it turns it white. It's awesome. Then you discover that one of the banisters is like disconnected at the bottom. Oh, great. Does this stuff like work glue, like glue? Or does, no, somebody, and then there's, you know, then the paint comes off the handrails. I'm not complaining, mind you, but the paint comes off of the handrails and then somebody's got to put another coat of paint on those handrails. Who's going to do that? You know, and you keep going and it seems like there's more and more that needs to be done and suddenly you realize, I don't have the time and the energy to do all of this. You ever approach God's Word that way where you look at the Word of God and you go, I just don't know how, I can't do that. And chapter 10, verse 16 says these words, and he said, come with me and see my zeal for the Lord. Now, I'm not going to get into the long debate about did Jehu do more than God asked him to. Well, it seems so, and it seems God holds him and Hosea accountable for that. But I think by and large, he's doing what God called him to do in 2 Kings chapter 10, what God said he would do. And I see this zeal for the Lord. Are you guys zealous to do what God's word says? Or are you like ho-hum? Notice the authenticity of the word of God, that God means what he says. I don't know that I can... Means what he says. It really will happen. And I suspect that there are some that would hope that what he said won't happen. And thus the comments you've heard me say before. My God would never. My God would never. My God did. 2 Kings chapter 10. How do you know that that God's Word is authentic? Well, look at his track record. He's always done what he said. Consider what he said. And the Word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite, saying, Arise, go down to meet Ahab, king of Israel, who is in Samaria. Behold, he is in the vineyard of Naboth, 
where he has gone to take possession. You know the story. Naboth's next door. He's got this vineyard. It's passed down. He's not really allowed to sell it to somebody else. Ahab goes, I want that. And he cries to Jezebel. And Jezebel goes, okay, well, we'll set him up and we'll kill him. And, and as soon as he was dead, Jezebel goes, Ahab, go get it, man. It's yours. But somebody was paying attention and his name is God. And then God says to Elijah, his mouthpiece, you shall say to him, thus says the Lord, have you killed and also taken possession? And you shall say to him, thus says the Lord, in the place where dogs lick the blood of Naboth, shall dogs lick your own blood. Ahab said to Elijah, have you found me, O my enemy? He answered, I have found you because you have sold yourself to do what is evil in the sight of the Lord. Behold, I will bring disaster upon you. I will utterly burn you up and will cut off from Ahab, listen to this, every male, bond or free in Israel. And I will make your house like the house of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, and like the house of Basha, son of Ahijah, for the anger to which you have provoked me and because you have made Israel to sin. And it goes on. And then in 2 Kings chapter 9, a chapter before this one, God speaks to Jehu and tells him almost the exact same thing. And all I want to tell you is that God takes His Word seriously. Not just the promises of prosperity, but also the declarations of destruction. Not just the destruction of the worship of Baal, but also the golden calves of Bethel and Dan. God noticed they weren't dealt with. We like to cherry pick, right? There there are plenty of what I would call warm, fuzzy verses in Scripture, the promises of prosperity. And we want to hold God accountable to that. God is faithful. He will keep His Word. He will give me these promises of prosperity. But who wants to talk about the declarations of destruction? The other verses, you know, the ones where we desperately strive to come up with reasons that God won't do that, or He really didn't do that. There's never reason to let God off the hook. God means what He says. I'm convinced that one of the purposes of 2 Kings chapter 10 is that our God wants us to know that He means what He says. Listen to Him. Take Him seriously. Do we trust that God means what He says when He says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God? The person in the pew next to you, the person in the house next to you, the person working next to you, the person in school next to you, do we honestly believe they have sinned and fall short of the glory of God? Well, yeah, I've watched them. Yeah, but, but do, we believe that God, when he, do we believe God when He said, for the wages of sin is death? What, what does He mean? They'll be eternally separated from the living God. You know what that's called? Hell. Do we really believe that? Or is that one of those things we're hoping that God gets over and He didn't really mean it? Do we really believe that the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus? Do we really believe that by grace you have been saved through faith and this is not your own doing, it's the gift of God, not a result of works that no one may boast? Or are we still somehow trying to earn our salvation? Do we really believe, Romans 8, 1, there is no condemnation for you who are in Christ Jesus? Do you believe that? Are you living under the weight of of shame that doesn't belong, that's been handled by Christ, who took it upon Himself and paid your price? Do you believe that? Did God really mean that? So sometimes I I, I fear that we might turn a deaf ear because we don't want to know, because we don't have the 
or, or we're not sure how that's going to work out, or we just don't believe it. But there may be another reason, and it's here in this text. And I think God wants you to see it. Not only is it the Word of God that won't fall to the earth, it will accomplish what He desires. But He calls us to the zeal because He will do it. He will accomplish it. But then there's this other thing that bothers me. And we get to the end of the chapter. And sometimes... So we can get to a point where we just say, I don't care. You ever say that? Not out loud, right? But you're just like, I don't know what to do with that, so I just, I just don't care. God of Israel, with all his heart, he didn't follow God with all his heart. God intends for us to obey his word, but to just treat it like a checklist, I don't think that's with all our heart. He calls us to love the God of his word. And if you don't know and love the God of His Word, you'll be inclined to manipulate and twist the Word of this God. Somewhere in the recesses of Jehu's heart was a place for these golden calves. It was a political move by Jeroboam years back who set up these golden calves in Bethel and Dan. And Jehu wasn't willing to remove them. And when I read those words, that he didn't follow the Lord with his whole heart, it seems like he just didn't care. Are there some glaring areas of disobedience in our own lives? You know, the one where the Holy Spirit just... When when it's just, you know, this overwhelming... That. You got one of those that's where the Holy Spirit is going, can we, let's talk about this. What's going on right here? It's time for you to stop. It's time for you to turn away from that and toward me. What is it? It occurs to me that we won't listen to what God has to say and we certainly won't trust that He means what He says if we don't know and love the One who's speaking. Listen to the psalmist in Psalm 19. The law of the Lord is perfect. You ever say that about the law of the Lord? The law of the Lord, it's perfect. Reviving the soul. Anybody been revived by the law of the Lord? The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned. In keeping them there is great reward. If my heart doesn't view God's Word in that way, something's words of the God that we love. You want to know the God that you love? 
Find out what you're listening to, believing in, and following. Without loving the God of the Word, we will gravitate toward the words, verses that make us feel good. The cost is, well, costly. Here's the, here's the catch. Of Him. I will only trust His Word when He enables me to love Him as I ought. Act of obedience that you've been dragging your feet on. Maybe you've turned a deaf ear, dismissed the authenticity of God's Word, or just flat out rebelled. Finances, you trusting Him with those? Are you following Him with your money? Relationally, a relationship that you can restore, you need to forgive? Is there some service, some way in which God has called you or gifted you and you've refused because you just don't feel adequate? Good. If you ever feel adequate, you're probably not the person. Word of God and listen to it. The challenge is to really believe that God will follow through on His Word and then for us to follow Him in obedience to His Word. And that's what Jehu did. And that's what I want to do. But I suspect like you, there are times when the excuses fly and the obedience doesn't. You may recall or at least heard of the hugely popular 1970s commercial for a stock brokerage that used the catchphrase, when E.F. Hutton speaks, people listen. The campaign showed people going about their everyday business, taking a jog, boarding a train, mingling at a de- dinner party, even theater directors. Shakespearean sword fight ensued. Then as conversation shifted to the stock market, one person would turn to the other and say, my broker is E.F. Hutton. And what happened in the commercial? Everything froze and everybody listened. It might behoove you to drop everything you're doing and pay close attention. Thankful for your word, and we confess to you there are times when we are weak in our listening skills. We are small at times in our faith, and resultingly slow in our obedience. And yet you are merciful and gracious, and you persistently place before us the truth of Your Word, even Your glory, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand. Get ready to sing. Sing out, even if you don't know it. Learn it, and we will learn it together today. Oh, yeah. 
mercy never fails me All my days I've been held in your hands From the moment that I wake up Until I lay my head Oh, I will see Of the goodness of God out together your goodness Cause your goodness is running out it's running out to me Cause your goodness is running out it's running out to me with my life laid down I'm surrendered now I give you
surround me
when I sing those words, I sing it with those prisoners who sang those words with Zach Williams. If you haven't watched that video, I would challenge you to do so. They sing it like they believe it. Do you? No longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. Will you bow with me for the benediction? Now to him who is able to strengthen you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery that was kept secret for long ages, but now has been disclosed and through the prophetic writings has been made known to the nations according to the command of the eternal God to bring about obedience of faith. To the only wise God be glory forevermore through Jesus Christ. Amen.